Hello everyone, so with this current generation of consoles, we had PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, a mid-cycle update with a bump to CPU, GPU, RAM, we got higher frame rates, higher resolutions, and that was great, all within the same life cycle of machines. And so we've been talking for a while now about how these consoles and the next-gen consoles are all about scalability being based off of x86, they're not these overly exotic architectures anymore, and so there's a general expectation that we'll get a PS5 Pro and another Xbox at some point three, four years down the line, although new comments have recently come up that paint a different picture to where maybe it wouldn't actually make a whole lot of sense, and it actually seems as though PS5 Pro might be very unlikely. So these comments come from Albert Pinello, formerly of Xbox, EA, Sega, he's been in the industry for a very long time. And over on Reset Era, there was a discussion about uh, PS5 technical specifications and mid-cycle updates came up. And I'm going to read you his post here where he says, It may simply be less necessary as well. 4K was becoming a mainstream resolution for PC and TVs, and the base consoles were designed around driving 1080p or less output. This is talking about PS4 and Xbox One. When you have a set that requires four times the performance just to drive four times the pixels, then you eat up all the performance just driving resolution. I think it's unlikely we'll see 8K TVs go mainstream in the same way we saw 4K go mainstream. We're more likely to see improvements in nits to drive better HDR or better frame rates to support greater than 60 FPS on TVs. CPUs and GPUs in the next gen should easily support higher frame rates and wider colors, so the mid-gen upgrades are not only less financially and technically viable, but also likely less necessary to keep up with display technologies. He follows up with a later post saying, I don't see a 20 to 24 teraflop machine being affordable in a console form factor even in three years. The no change from 7 nanometer to 5 nanometer or 3 nanometer is going to be cost prohibitive and just mathematically, unless they hit 3 nanometer, you're only going to see a 30% reduction in size, but you're doubling the T-flops so the chip has to grow. Additionally, you can't really double the GPU without growing CPU and memory or you run into other bottlenecks which adds further to cost. There may be other silicon advancements I'm not privy to, but it's pretty widely known this is a real challenge right now. So looking through today's lens, I think it's unlikely you're going to see a mid-gen console this cycle. The rest of the thread has some pretty good arguments for, but also against mid-cycle updates, and it's honestly one I did not consider uh, going into the next generation, where because we had PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, it's a general expectation for the ninth generation of consoles that we will see another mid-cycle update at some point. But it's even more an expectation, I think, for a lot of people when you look at what Microsoft's doing with Xbox Series X, where the entire nomenclature is based around a family of consoles, Xbox Series Blank where X is their powerhouse and presumably Series S, an unannounced console right now, but will presumably be their lower priced, less powerful machine that will still be next gen just based off the fact that it will have probably the same CPU, the same SSD, slightly less RAM because you don't need as much for the overhead of what is a less powerful GPU. So it's more a 1080p machine, but you're still getting a lot of next gen texture advancements, ray tracing, things like that. They're still gonna be very beautiful looking games on Series S but it's all about scalability, and that was what's so great about PS4 Pro and Xbox One X in this current generation of consoles. It's living in the same generation, but it's scalability. You get slightly better performance for what is still a PS4 and an Xbox One. Although, when you think about the Xbox Series nomenclature, what letter do you use to signify a machine is more powerful than Xbox Series X, where the letter X is already the Xbox wheelhouse, right? You sort of expect that as the most powerful machine. What do you call uh, another Xbox three, four years down the line? Perhaps Microsoft already on day one is presenting their mid-cycle case where it's not mid-cycle. Xbox Series X is a very powerful machine, which it is, and then you have the option of a more affordable Xbox day one, which would be your Lockhart machine, starting price of around, let's say, $399, maybe $349, but it wouldn't be that much cheaper. Either way, whatever that price is day one, you can also afford to then go $299, then go $249 throughout the entirety of the life cycle. Same with Series X. The price of that machine also decreases. You know what I mean? It's just something to think about. But when we look at something like PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, uh, how do we really justify what those machines were doing for their place in time? Were they more of an experiment? Or were they an expectation that, hey, this is what we'll be doing moving forward? To which, for a long time, I always thought, yeah, that's probably where we should be going. More frequent console updates and uh, you can buy whenever you choose to buy because there's all the scalability so you're never pressured to jump into another machine unless it's truly some kind of big next generation jump. The one thing that a lot of people always um, kind of lost sight of when it came to PS4 Pro and Xbox One X is that the machines were supposed to be uh, huge, huge sellers for both for both Sony and Microsoft, but inherently they were always low volume machines. Now, the only data we have here uh, from 2017 is Sony confirming that about one every five PlayStation 4 sales is a PS4 Pro model. That tells you right then and there, 
it's not necessarily something that Sony did to sell a bunch of PlayStation 4 Pros, but something for a little bit of audience retention, for consumer retention, keep people into the ecosystem, offer an additional upgrade. And same with Microsoft, where Xbox One X was not going to take the Xbox brand uh, to the very top, right? Uh, Microsoft doesn't disclose any numbers, but you'd also imagine that it's a very low volume machine compared to what is more than likely most sales being Series S machines or Xbox One machines, excuse me. So obviously these mid-cycle consoles are not meant to move 30, 40 million units, but rather somewhere in the neighborhood of 5, 10 to 15 million. It's really tough to gauge that exact number, of course. Sony or Microsoft does not give us that entire breakdown, but PS4 Pro came 2016. We didn't give a one in five metric until 2017. So we can't use the whole 100 plus million PS4 install base. And even if you did, for example, use the full 100 million install base that gives us about 20 million ps4 pros which we know is more than likely not the case probably lower than that probably closer to 15 million or a little bit under that but uh, when we go to 2018 we have an interesting tweet from matt piscatella who's a video game analyst for the mpd group i found this very fascinating uh, in 2018 he said hardware cycles as we know them are over he makes some additional comments in that tweet but somebody said could you elaborate on hardware cycles as we know them being over now this is a pretty hyperbolic statement but he does reply so the decay curve for hardware sales used to look like a normalized curve very predictable changes from year to year all you really needed was year one sales of a new console and you could predict using history what the five to seven year curve would look like pretty closely he goes on to say now due to the iteratives pro and x and bigger consumer response to promotion we're seeing those normalized curves be no longer useful xbox one sales being up dramatically in its sixth calendar year for example or ps4 setting new records the first few years of the cycle did look normalized but now basically you have a normalized curve covering the first four years or so and then it's like a kid took a crayon and just started drawing whatever lines they liked highly unpredictable keep in mind he's talking about predictability here so despite ps4 doing much better than xbox one for example it's just based off of that particular machine's first few years and understanding where the curve would be naturally based off of a five to seven year life cycle where there's a downward trend at a certain point there's always a certain peak it continuously goes down year over year until you enter a new generation of consoles where those prior years after the peak are a bit more unpredictable. Then we also have in that same Twitter thread, Seamus Blackley, widely known as the father of Xbox, saying it's not that weird. It's becoming the PC. Software has become cross-platform compatible at a quality level where hardware cycles are less important. It's always about the content. Imagine the content as the water pressure and the hardware as the nozzle. Basically, you can introduce a new set of consoles that aren't just slimmed down machines, offer something much more tangible, and keep them in the same ecosystem, thus not having a huge spike in sales, but you are slowing down that typical downward trend that we often see. It's at this point I'd like to highlight a quote from Andrew House, where at the time he was the president and CEO of Sony Interactive Entertainment back in 2016. When launching the PS4 Pro and when talking about PS4 Pro, he said, I saw some data that really influenced me. It suggested that there's a dip mid-console lifecycle where the players who want the very best graphical experience will start to migrate to PC, because that's obviously where it's to be had. We want to keep those people within our ecosystem by giving them the very best and the very highest performance quality. So the net result of those thoughts was PlayStation 4 Pro and by and large, a graphical approach to game improvement. This is where we can really best rationalize a mid-cycle update because when we look at sales, obviously they're not taking the world by storm. However, the type of users that typically buy a PlayStation 4 Pro or an Xbox One X, outside of the usual circumstance that a casual consumer might say, I just want the very best. Outside of that, if they were already owning a PS4 or an Xbox One and they buy that mid-cycle update, they are more than likely a very engaged user into your ecosystem, and that's the entire console business model, where manufacturers do not make their money off of one console sale. For decades within the video game industry, the console business model is sell one console, sell lots of software. What do we do with these HD internet connected consoles? We buy lots of DLC, season passes, microtransactions, subscriptions, PlayStation Plus, Xbox Live, Xbox Game Pass, PlayStation Now. They want you into this ecosystem. So despite the fact that PlayStation 4 Pro and Xbox One X are low volume machines, they want very engaged users. It's all about that software tie ratio. It's all about investing all your money into third party games on that particular uh, piece of hardware. It's all about buying content from the PlayStation store from Xbox Live, it keeps people into their ecosystem. So despite the fact that it sounds a bit weird to say, oh, we want to try and, you know, market against PC, the real idea here is that they want people to stay within PlayStation because that one particular console where 
even if it doesn't stay with the consumer, if it goes second hand and somebody buys it used, that's fine. Sony would totally support a used console market, same with Microsoft, because that one console still continues to sell software through physical sales, through digital sales, through subscription sales. That's what they really want. But see, the more I think about it, Albert presents a very compelling argument where maybe we won't get a PS5 Pro, or maybe it'll be much further down the line because this generation will be longer than what we're expecting, where it's back to PS3 and 360, about seven to eight years long, and that gives Sony and Microsoft enough room and headway to place a mid-gen machine in the center where it's financially viable, but also because you're presenting a decent leap and leaving yourself with enough room to present another next generation machine whenever we get a PlayStation 6, right? I know this is very far out, but this is something you really have to consider where what we're getting right now, this holiday 2020, these are very powerful machines, right? There's a very good price to performance ratio being presented to consumers, much more so than what we saw for PS4 and Xbox One back in 2013. These are gonna be very capable consoles. And because of that, it really does make a case for how do you market a mid-cycle console and what do you truly offer outside of what we're seeing right now, right? We have diminishing returns. Uh, we're, we're sort of exiting Moore's Law. I mean, we're not really seeing these big visual jumps. Now we're seeing some very huge quality of life improvements and, and certainly there are a lot of very impressive technical advancements that we're seeing on next gen. Something like ray tracing is very intensive on hardware, but it's a beautiful rendering technique. Lighting is very important for games and something like ray tracing, I'm telling you, is gonna look fantastic in a lot of games that fully utilize this beautiful global illumination, you know, this this real this real time bouncing of light, it will look fantastic. But arguably, this is something where a lot of casual consumers might not notice something like that. Same with the SSDs. I mean, Sony's SSD is already blazing fast. I don't think that needs to get any faster by any stretch. Uh, you could make the case that these consoles will absolutely have 4K 30 FPS games. I think people are very upset about that, right? You're going to see plenty of 4K 30 FPS games on PS5 and Series X. So you can make the case that another next gen or another mid cycle jump could be offering 60 fps across the board but like albert's saying that might not be very financially viable even three years down the line for these consoles where we're already seeing series x and ps5 being very large machines because that's what the silicon demands and so you know you could see slimmer machines but to try and you know double the performance on some of these consoles which you, you don't see as big of a visual jump. I mean, it's it's actually a hard case to make, especially when, you know, bringing up 8K. I mean, that's kind of a scapegoat at this point. 8K is not going to be a very viable thing to, to try and chase. And so how do you market a mid-cycle machine? Because, because frame rate might be a very tough sell. And I know that may sound very weird for a lot of people. How could frame rate be a tough sell? You know, if you're even watching this video, you more than likely love a high frame rate. But for most people, that's just really, really not the case. Your, your casual console buyer, it's not something they consider. But perhaps the biggest angle to consider here is that if you offer a PS5 Pro, you are really selling yourself short for what would be a PS6 because of diminishing returns. Thankfully, PS4 Pro and Xbox One X could heavily capitalize on 4K. That coincided nicely with that mass adaptation of uh, that display resolution. But uh, it would be a difficult challenge going into PS5 Pro and even further PlayStation 6. So to be honest, all things considered, I could certainly see us not getting PS5 Pro, just a slim console and slight model revisions down the road, just like Microsoft, that's an expectation. But I could also still see mid-cycle updates just in the sense that I don't think you have to coincide marketing with some sort of massive adoption of a new display resolution. You can speak directly to this low volume but very engaged consumer that would know about these things and present your argument of a machine that's on paper slightly two times more powerful than the base models, right? I think there's still a place for that. I just don't know if that really makes sense for Sony and Microsoft this time around. That's about it for this conversation. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't yet, of course, please subscribe for the best PlayStation news, reviews, and updates that are here on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Mystic Ryan, and that is it. I will see you all in my next video. You take it easy.